what do you think makes a good leader? I think at the end of the day, it comes down to practice what you preach. And to the extent that you are passionate about what you're talking about, you are committed about what you're talking about, you're respectful to people, you know, that comes back to you. So I, I believe, you know, and I'm not, look, there are certain situations where maybe you have to lead by fear. But in a business situation, and I always tell people, you know, the doors aren't locked from the inside. So in a business like ours where we don't have patents, we don't have big manufacturing equipment, our intellectual property are the people that work for us. And every single day they all walk home, and then every morning they exercise their right to come back. So if you don't take good care of people, they don't come back. And it's just that's the model we work under. So I try and, you know, I try and take care of people. And you know, the old golden rule that you know, I learned when I was a little kid I think still applies to me as an adult. And you have to be decisive and not being afraid to be decisive because people want to follow someone they believe in and they want to follow someone they believe will take them to a better place for whatever it is. So you have to project that. And if you project that, people will follow. Do you think the leadership style changes during the crisis or do you think it's the fundamental quality that still stays the same but you just need to do different things during the crisis? Well, I think I've always said that it's in a good situation almost anybody can lead and the real test of leadership is not how you manage when things are going well, it's how you manage when things are going bad. So for some people, I think it's less about change than being consistent and I think that what you see are people that are true leaders, that shines more when things are going tough. Like you mentioned, uh, communication. Uh, that's key to me, uh, a very key. In a knowledge-based work environment, which I have, it's not all, but mine is more, we're not a manufacturing operation, we're dealing with people for whom you know, knowledge is critical and you've got to give it to them. You know, I think back to, I, as I talk to other people, I have a few kind of basic rules and I think that in times past, go back in more 50s traditional kind of, you know, what you think of Sloan management style, power really was derived by those that controlled it. And the more power information how you controlled it, and the more information you held, the need to know principle, you were more and more powerful. And what I think the internet did is it really upended it. And in fact, these days, power is being driven more by how well you're sharing information and disseminating it rather than controlling it. So as you look at companies and you look at successful individuals, those that understand how to share information, how to disseminate it and make it work for the better good are far more powerful, if you want to use that word, than people who kind of hunker down in that need to know mentality. Because that just doesn't cut it in today's. You know, look at Twitter and you know, the Arab Spring and all this, that it, you know, information is really just profoundly important. You brought up a great point about internet uh, and how you use different tools out there to communicate your message as a leader. Can you tell me a little bit how you are leveraging the social media, internet, to, to lead your organization? You know, again, it's about information and sharing information. And if people see you as a source of information, they see you as a source of reliable and truthful information, and that they feel that they have an understanding and they don't need to know the big picture but at least how they under how they fit in that whole picture that makes it easier to lead and in some ways the leadership comes almost automatic and I don't want to diminish the fact that it isn't a lot of work but it's a lot easier when people understand where they're going and they're marching with you than you know when you literally have to drag them and I've seen organizations where you have management that literally has to you know figuratively and in some cases literally drag their people with them because people don't know what's going on and they just you know they feel like they're being pulled and pulled and pulled and that's resistance and they resist and that's energy and you know, I laugh that you know, early on in school we had a science test and one of the questions was you know if, if I said you Russell I put you out in the street and I push against your building all day long and you you know you sweat you f finally fell over completely exhausted pushing on your building but you didn't do any nothing moved how much work did you do and my people, oh, I worked hard, look, I'm sweating, I'm falling apart, I spent the whole day. But the reality is work equals force times distance. So it doesn't matter how much you force it, if nothing happens, you've done zero work. And so I think that's the way you kind of have to almost think about how you manage your day and how you lead, that it's not just about force, it's about force and distance combined that create work. So, so what you're essentially saying that as a leader, we must communicate our mission, our purpose, and our values effectively to our team member in order to lead them effectively. A absolutely. You know, one of my mentors, or one of the people I've always looked up to, uh, was Admiral Grace Hopper. 
And at 79, she died over a decade ago, I think about a decade ago, she was the oldest commissioned naval officer. And most people may not know she also invented COBOL. And most people quote her with inventing the word a computer bug because of a moth she found in her computer. But I heard her speak once and she basically said, look, if you get to a fork in the road, the only bad decision is to do nothing and sit down. You've got to go left or you've got to go right. And if you imply the tiniest bit of intelligence in terms of going left or right, the odds favor you winning. And I think the same thing then applies about you know, work and you think about leadership, but that you got to give people a direction. And the worst thing you do is come to a fork or road and sit. And you've seen a lot of big companies. Um, you know, right now Yahoo, I think, is a good example of they've come to so many forks in the road and they just sit down. So you sit back, someone outside, and saying, why are they doing that? Like, do something, but just to sit there and do nothing. And then it just spirals out of control. And people are, I think, People are, have more and are aware of more than maybe they get credit for from management. That employees in the rank and file recognize that. They start to wonder, why am I doing what am I doing? And all that energy, again, it's not forced to push the company a distance. That creates work. It's just energy that goes in circles, and that doesn't create any work for me. How did you learn the leadership? Is this, did you have a coach? Did you hire a mentor? Did you read about it? Or is this something just happened over the years? Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> I mean, that is the reality of it. I think that, you know, Simon Cowell on American Idol, right, calls the it factor. There's some element that you can't necessarily teach. I mean, some factor, some people have it. I'm completely terrible at sports. You could give me a coach, you give me a mentor, you give me lessons for days and days and months and years, and I will be no better at basketball then than I am today. And I don't have that it factor, but I think the same thing applies. So it's uh, an innate ability that you have that you enjoy. I mean, I think, again, you have to like working with people, you have to like helping people get to better places. And then you add in layers of uh, great training. I mean, I worked for some great companies that gave me some phenomenal training. Uh, being in the training industry, I haven't been afraid to call on mentors or coaches. And every one of those things you do just gets, you know, you become finer and finer and finer and finer at what you do until you're good at it. You were involved into the publishing business. Uh, you uh, have built uh, online colleges. Uh, uh, you, uh, so you're, you're completely involved in the, why? Why the education industry? No, I think... There were a lot of doctors in my family, uh, and I thought, you know, I've always been surrounded by people who focused on helping other people. And as I thought about my particular interests, uh, honestly, in college, I went out starting down the path of medicine and decided that for my own personal life, you know, I wanted to make sure that I had time for a family as well, and there was a level of commitment and dedication and to put anything else out of your mind that I couldn't necessarily find for business but it didn't dampen my interest in helping people find themselves or get to a better place. And that's what I love about education in that, you know, there's that aha moment when you see someone who gets it, when you see that they're here and now they're here and the gratitude and the benefit their lives have taken from going from place one to place two that I really like. You know, that's my elixir for happiness. You know, I, watching other people get there makes me real happy. And it doesn't matter. I mean, I, in IT training, you know, there's some point you know, in the early days when we had, for the early days of PCs, we taught people about mice. I mean, how many people picked it up and clicked at the screen? You know, there was always that aha moment or in communication skills training when someone's you know, literally sick and literally sick to go in front of a group of people and you get them to that point where maybe they're not loving it, but at least they say, I can get up today, I can do my presentation, I don't have to worry about whether there's a bathroom close by. You know, that's really making a fundamental change in people's lives and I like doing that. I mean, that's, you know, other people like, amassing piles of money. Other people like, you know, designing sofas and rugs or building planes. I like helping people get to another place, get to the next place they want to get to, to take their lives in a better space. Over the years, by running a learning organization, what I realized and what I believe in, a best-run organization is a learning organization. Uh, so my question to you, that, that if an organization want to build a learning culture, what advice do you have for them, how can they build a learning culture within their own organization? Well, uh, I have to think of it exactly, and I'll tell you, the, it was either the first or second episode of Bad Men this year, if you watch it. Um, someone made the content of like stability, and they said, uh, stability is that first step between success, moving backwards from success to failure. And I thought, I'm gonna have the quote right, but I thought it was like an amazing quote, which spoke to me that 
in any organization, the day you stop moving forward, you automatically start going backwards. And in a world that moves, it seems that it's moving, you know, Moore's law keeps applying over and over again. Every year things are twice as fast. Information is twice as ready. You have no choice but to move your organization forward. Because the day you stop moving forward, everybody else moves forward, you automatically just start moving backwards. So I think in many ways it's hard not to imagine that. And again, it comes back to my concept of Power today is derived not on how you control and, and you hoard information, by how well you share it. And if by default you're someone that's sharing information, you're automatically creating a learning organization. It's like you can't have one without the other. So to the extent that you're willing to share information, you're automatically going to create a learning organization. It's not really that difficult. I really think that. You know, if you're a leader and you go hide in your office and you have three or four people that are the only people you'll deal with and you bark orders out, you can rest assured that your organization is not going to learn. If you're out there, you're talking to people, you're sharing information, they're going to learn. Sometimes not always the best things, maybe, but they're learning. And it's really simple. It's not a complicated formula. I believe different people learn differently. I even wrote a book called Learning Method, that how can you develop an effective learning method. And there's a lot of statistics out there which method is most effective. So I, I wanted to get you inside. Which learning method is the most effective learning method? That's a great question. I don't know if you can say one is the most effective, but my tendency, and that comes my psychology bias, is the more I want to think about how things are going forward, I tend to go backward. So if you ask me about learning, and I think you know, plenty of research will support it, although it's hard to quantify it exactly, but most people will say that in the first two years of life, you probably do most of the learning. The vast majority of all the learning you're going to do for the rest of your life happens in those first two years learning to walk, learning to communicate, learning to uh, socialize with other people, learning to move your body around in space, learning that, you know, hot things hurt, sharp things hurt, um, you know, family is important, uh, risk, how to manage risk, how to manage danger. That happens when you're young, and how's that learning? It's experiential, it's in the world, it's with the help of guides and experts, your parents, your teachers, all that. And then somehow as you seem to age, you move into this modality where it's less experiential, it's less expert driven, it's less, you know, all those things. So if you ask me about, you know, the best way to learn, I like to watch little kids and I watch how they're learning and I like to take that and then apply it. Now granted that doesn't necessarily mean that a classroom in the future has to be a bunch of kids playing with toys, but that way of learning, that literally getting involved, you know, they always say that, you know, kids got to get dirty, right? They're learning when they're getting dirty and I think the same thing does apply to some extent to adults and maybe not in a literal sense, but in a figurative sense, if you're trying to learn, you should get a little dirty once in a while. And from that dirtiness comes this, you know, this aha moment where you get forward. So that's my kind of advice is if you want to think about the best ways to learn, go watch a bunch of kids in the playground. Watch how they interact and how they're learning. Or watch a toddler learn to walk and talk. And try and apply that to the, what you're doing as an adult and you're going to get far more effective learning than any other method. Since you are in the learning industry, uh, Bill, one of the things I see that's happening within uh, Netcom Learning is that the way people learn is completely changing now. I see that a lot of people are taking live online classes versus uh, four or five years ago, we couldn't convince people to take live online class. Uh, I see that number of students coming to the classroom training is declining, even though overall people that are taking classes uh, are increasing. What's What's your prediction uh, about the learning industry? Do you think it's going to change drastically? Do you think the classroom training is going to completely go away? I think the answer to this question is yes and no. So I do think the industry is on the break of a drastic change, but I don't think classroom training is going to go away. It's funny hearing you talk about you love to read and you like to find out, and I'm thinking you like to play. And that's one of the most effective ways of learning. I mean, as a young child, that's how they learn. So you're saying it as an adult and using fancier words, but at the end of the day, for you, this kind of uh, self-guided discovery, relying on resources to get to what you want, wanting it and kind of finding and pulling it out, that's your aha moment. You like to play. And that's great. I mean, that's a phenomenal way of learning. And I, you know what? I think everybody should. If you just allowed yourself to say that and allowed yourself to think about having, letting other people do that, you come to a place that's really effective. And I think that, you know, for a long time the only way to learn was kind of classroom. Instructor, more traditionally instructor-led, you know, the standard model. You sit, you watch, someone teaches, you learn. And then in the last several years, uh, cost pressures, time pressures, uh, economic pressures, it kind of led a lot of companies to move much more toward this kind of e-learning 
where you, know, you take the instructor out of the process, now you're kind of learning on your own. And the reality is, is given the cost pressure, the time pressure, the people, you know, economic pressures, in many cases that's, you know, everybody's trying to get as effective as the one-on-one, -on -one, but it hasn't been that effective. And I think now that the new technology that's coming to pass, you know, always being connected, mobile devices, are really getting us to a point where the pendulum's going to swing back towards, swing back toward instructor-led. Will it be everybody in a classroom? No way. But the idea is you still have experts helping you learn. I mean, inherently we kind of know as a society that the fastest way to transfer a rapid amount of information now is person to person. You get them together. Facebook, they say it's going to be worth $100 billion. Is it a $100 billion software platform? Not really. I mean, we tried to do message on Facebook. It's like AOL in 1980, 1990, you know, that's it. But what does it do? It allows people to connect. It allows you to transfer. And how else could I transfer information about what's going on in my life to that many people that quickly and get that kind of feedback? It's, it's an amazingly powerful story. But again, it's a story about information. It's a story about empowerment. It's a story about connecting people. And it's clear that kind of this next wave of computing that we're getting into is less about the fact that, you know, it's super fast and super fancy than it is about empowering and connecting people. And for us in the learning industry, I think it's, it bodes incredibly well that I think the pendulum's about to swing backward toward this whole idea of instructor-led, expert-facilitated, you know, this people-to-person-to-person -to -person learning, which now we're going to be able to do efficiently. I want to find out that how did you end up studying a logical operation? Was that your first business? That was my first business, yeah, uh, with my best friend, two, uh, several, a few college professors, and it was just a discussion about how do we, you know, we, we had something good, we knew we had it good, and then how do we get to the next place? And for me, it was my way of balancing risk. You know, I, my entrepreneurial was, that's the it factor. It somehow felt it was in my blood, and I was working at the time for Kodak, a great, at the time, great, you know, big, you know, at that point part of the Dow, and, you know, having a good time and learning a lot, but I wasn't, I didn't get that fulfillment. I wanted to kind of be in business for myself. So I was willing to take a little bit of risk. And sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. And you know, I've had successes and I've had failures. And, but on the whole, there have been more successes than failures. But I've learned from every one of them. And that was really it. You know, it's hard to, for me it was just the idea of I wanted to have more, I wanted a more, a personal investment. I guess for me it was about being invested in what I was doing and know that I could have some control over it too. Why do you think your companies all these companies that you have built became successful? Or why do you think logical operation became successful? I'm one of the lucky few, I think, that has had a chance to have a vocation or a work that's also an avocation. I love what I do. And that makes it easier. And I can't think of any other way of saying that. And some of the people I know that have been the most successful, if you look at, you know, just in the tech space, you look at, you know, Steve Jobs, or you look at Bill Gates, or Mark Zuckerberg, and then you go into another industry like fashion, and you look at, you know, Calvin Klein and Michael Kors picking some. These are people, when you hear them talk, they're passionate. They're absolutely passionate. It may not be your passion, but it comes through that they love what they're doing. And to me, that makes job much easier. And, and you know, so I would, the advice I give to people is, to the extent that you can have a vocation and avocation merge, your probability of success automatically goes up because you're going to do the things that you perceive to be right, and often they are. And the trouble is when you are going through the motions or when your job is not something that you take with you. You know, I think about it all the time, I'll admit it. You know, it can be disruptive sometimes, but I mean, I'm always thinking about how do, we, how do we do the next thing, how do we do something better, how do we provide product services that are better for people. And, if you can integrate that into your life, you're going to be successful. Again, it's, you know, I, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but for me, I would say if it's not something you can be passionate about, go find something else. I mean, you've got to have something you're passionate about, but try and find a vocation and a vocation that match. People, quality product, and customer service is what I, we thought from our study in why your company became successful. Do you agree with that assessment and what else would you like to add if you? Yeah, I think it again comes down to passion. I mean, you know, all parts of the business we tend to search for and I think people tend to gravitate toward our business because it is a passionate business. But, it, you know, it's funny, in the, it, we've, part of our job is we train trainers in the classroom how to be a successful trainer. And one of the questions that always comes up that we bring in our standard trainer training is, you have to be enthusiastic when you teach, period. So we say to people, you know, 
there are basically two ways to be enthusiastic when you go into the classroom. Either you're, it's real or fake it. But the reality is, is you've got to put your problems behind, you've got to go in the classroom, you've got to be enthusiastic. Because that enthusiasm translates into other people and if they perk up, they're paying attention to you, and that's what you want to translate to people. And sometimes it's just enthusiasm over that two or three day span of a course to gather that content, to kind of you know, bring that learning into play. But at the end of the day, that passion, that enthusiasm translates. And it doesn't, you know, it's interesting for me, and I look at, you know, I've been lucky to some extent, and I will say it's, there's an element of luck there. A lot of it's hard work, which isn't luck, it's hard work. But also I've been in industries where there's good rewards for that. And then I look at teachers in the U.S. of another industry where if you want to be a kindergarten, if you want to be a K-12 through teacher anywhere in the United States, you better be passionate about it. Because they're jobs that don't pay as well as other jobs. They're jobs that have in, uh, incredible hurdles. But then I have a young son and I go to school and I pick him up. I'm involved with the school committee in my town. That's passion that even exceeds what I can, en I can envision for myself. And that gives me, you know, I look at that group of people and I say, that's who I want to emulate. You know, my, my peers or my mentors are the people that go into a classroom every day trying to change these kids' lives. And if you can take some of that energy and apply it to your job, you're going to be successful. I want you to define your company. I know about your company, and I want to lo know more about uh, logical operation. Uh, t tell us a little bit about more about your company. At the core of it is, is that in the last 30 years, and it's hard to believe we're coming up on the 30th anniversary of the introduction of the personal computer, and not the computing is, but the reality is, is that these devices have literally overtaken our lives and they went, they gone to desktops, now they're in the home and I don't know about you but I carry three of them at any, I mean I have my, no, my, uh, my Kindle, my tablet, my laptop, I mean you're carrying all this around. So you have all these tools that are supposed to somehow make your life better. And we look at all these tools and we say, you know, in, in many cases people get very little utility out of the tool beyond the simplest usage and I look back at some people you know they use their laptop frankly a pad of paper and a pencil would probably be more effective and it will weigh a lot less so for us it's all about helping get pe match the potential of people and the potential of technology put those two of them together because when you take that one plus one you don't get two you get three and I think back at you know throughout the 80s and the early 90s they always talked about this productivity paradox that you know in the US alone trillions of dollars or hundreds of millions and billions have been spent on PC computing, IT, I mean, all the money that Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Dell, HP, Compact, IBM, put them all together and made in a decade plus yet the productivity bar barely moved in the United States and what was going on there and I think that that was that initial initially when people see something new they see, oh, that's a faster way to do what I was doing before. But being able to create a spreadsheet faster, being able to type a letter rather than doing it, you do it on your spreadsheet faster. Being able to, you know, access your bank account faster, that wasn't getting the productivity. And it's only, it took time before we got to those transformational effects, and that's when the real productivity started to take off. And then you look at, you know, the 1990s being considered an, in a you know, time of great economic expansion. And there's plenty of research to tie that with this transformational effect technology had on people and the ability now to do stuff in new ways. It's not so much that I can get my bank account balance on faster. It's the fact that I can do that when I'm in Delhi last week. I can put a card in, push a few buttons, and how much money I have, I can walk away with money. I mean, 10 years ago, that would have been going to American Express office, filling out some form, coming back two days later to get cash. I mean, that transformed my ability. You know, in one week, I could go to three different countries and travel around the world, and I left with roughly 10 U.S. dollars in my pocket, and I came back with 10 U.S. dollars in my pocket, and I was able to do that without a fear. That's kind of the, you know, the, the point you can get to about transforming. That's what our business is about. We're trying to take you know, the ability of people to be more productive and the technology. Put those two together, and that's where you get that. Again, that one plus one is three factor, and that's the business we're in. What is your growth strategy for your company? Because I know that you're a kind of person uh, who's consistently looking for profitable growth, and I'm sure you have some strategies uh, that's in action. So how do, you, how do you plan to grow your company? You know, I said earlier I thought that there was kind of the pendulum was swinging the other way, back from more money and more profit in the e-learning, back into kind of the classroom, and I'd say that's our growth strategy. I mean, I think of the 1980s when the introduction of the PC and that massive decade of massive investment by companies in both computers and people 
and the fortune I had to be able to ride that kind of wave that as people bought computers, bought software, bought things, they got to do it. And most people are lucky to get that once in a lifetime. I mean, the automobile came out in the late 1800s, we're 140 odd years into the era of the automobile. And yeah, each year they get a little bit more efficient, a little more effective, a little bit more comforts, but the basic industry is the same. And now I look at our industry today in the last, you know, the last quarter, what, tablet computers are outselling laptops two to one. Companies, half of the Fortune 500 or some number close to that, are now allowing people to bring your own device to work. You know, compared to a few years ago where it was a corporate computer that you got in a corporate cell phone or nothing. Um, Windows 8's coming down the road, and I don't know if you've had a chance to see it. It is very different. And, you know, the whole, the whole, every, you boot up, there's no more start menu. So we've been relying on this button for the last 30, you know, 20 years of clicking a button, it's gone. We're going to get a second wave. And for me, it's, the growth is there. It's about screwing up, not about, <laughs> I mean, really it is. It's really, you know, it, the, next, the next decade for me is about not screwing up. I mean, the potential is there and exists for many, many people. I'm always interested to find out about failure stories because I believe that you can learn a lot more from your failures than your success. So share one of your failure stories. Well, I think a, a good example of an early failure that actually turned it around was in the early 1990s. All of our competitors were doing training on CD-ROMs, video discs, etc. Um, we were not in that business. We were owned by a much larger company. Uh, my boss at the time said there were sources of cash and users of cash, and my business was a source, which means I had to give more than I took. So I had limited investment potential. So at the time, knowing we couldn't do that, we decided to go work with a small company to build an uh, e-learning-based product. And the product was actually quite a failure. I mean, these people couldn't deliver on time, we were late. The product barely met the needs of the few people that were on the internet. And most people were ready to just, you know, pull up shop. And I was able to take a step back and say, let's break out the component pieces of what didn't work and what did work. And from that I said, you know, you know the old thing of throwing the baby out with the bathwater is that, you know, what didn't work was our partnership, what didn't work was, you know, the timing, but what was going to work was this and I stuck to it. And I think a great modern example of that, and I know you could probably break down the pieces, but I, I look at Global Crossing and I look at that, you know, massive build out of fiber worldwide infrastructure bandwidth, right? And you think back probably now a decade ago where they flamed out and the belief was you know Global Crossing had created 10 times the bandwidth the world will ever need. They were right, they just had the wrong timing. And so sometimes failure is, you know, in my case it was a failure of timing and maybe a failure of, of, of tactics more than it was a failure of strategy. And you get there. I was involved in another business which was a K-12 uh, product line. And despite the fact that it was an amazing product and helped kids learn math immeasurably. We weren't part of a mainstream curriculum. So we would go to schools and they would say, you know, here's the state test, this is what we have to teach. We know that helps kids, it's a great idea, but we're not gonna use it. So I learned that sometimes even the best idea, the best strategy, the best tactics, don't you get you a success point. And I realized there that, you know, my lesson from that is, you have gotta understand the whole picture and you gotta look at it all and sometimes pure will you know, all the force in the world isn't going to move that, that building one inch, and that's what it came down to, was I applied a, hell of, a whole bunch of force against that product, and we didn't get anywhere because we never got any distance. So at the end of the day, I didn't do any work. 